Wat zijn de vijf belangrijkste liedjes uit je leven? What's the music that makes you tick? Five essential tracks starring Elbow. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Cheers, thanks for having us. Um, was this a long and hard discussion between all members of the band? It was hell. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, blackmail, bribery, physical violence, but we've, we've done it. Let's start off with track number one. Mm. Which um, track do you want to start off with? Uh, let's go with Magnificent to start. It's all gonna be magnificent. That was the first single of the new album, right? Yeah, and I wasn't there when the music was written, so you'll have to ask Pete about that. How did that come about? Um, well, it was upstairs at Guy's house. Guy wasn't there, but... Um, he had his key. And we had his key, and um, in, in the attic in Guy's house, old house, he he has a studio, and so like me, Craig, and Pot would get together every day, and we'd just kind of like someone would bring something in, or we'd just kind of like come up with it. You know, Craig would have a beat. I think that this one was kind of, I think the beat came first. Me and Pot initially had this quite clockworky sort of thing. The, the the guitar that you hear is still there, but the bass has changed. Um, and it was just one of those things that we just sort of like bashed through. We just kind of, you know, you know, it was kind of everything that you hear now, but not the strings was there mm. when we sent it to Guy. Yeah. I was on my honeymoon in Sardinia. I got married last summer and I knew the lads were working at home. <clears throat> and of course, not being there is unusual for me. So uh, I asked my wife if she minded if I listened to what the lads had been doing. Because um, it is a real amazing thing to, at the end of each day, Craig pops it on the internet and it's there for us all to listen to, you know. Whoever's been absent that day can plug in, you know. They sent me this piece of music and I went and picked it up. But when I was in internet range in, in order to pick this thing up, uh, I got all the news we'd been missing uh, and it was all black and awful, really horrible, you know, mm -hmm. usual shit, loads of violence and... I, I was waking up to my new wife and we were talking about our childhood. She told me about beachcombing when she was a kid. We were listening to kids playing by the beach all day, every day, which is the loveliest noise mm -hmm. ever. Um, and then balanced with what was going on in the news and then this extraordinary, lovely, dramatic piece of music from the lads, which was begging for strings, you know, particularly Pot's guitar line, it's so urgent. Uh, and uh, I just mushed the things together and ended up being a, a, a big note of hope. It's always worth, you know, like any little idea. It's always worth putting it down. I remember me, Guy and Jupp a few years ago. And if you heard what we did, it, it wouldn't point in any way to, to where it ended up. But um, starting Lippy Kids, didn't we? We're in the big room in, in Salford in, in our studio. And it was like a really kind of like stupid delayed bass sound and stuff. And, you know, and, and it was Guy on the piano you know, with the melody and stuff. But it, but it was something that actually was just left for ages. And then it was kind of like, let's work on that. Like the, the spark. Yeah, yeah, the sort of seed of something great. Spiritualized. Spiritualized. Why that track? Um, Ladies and gentlemen, We Are Floating in Space is an album that, that we've, that, that it, it We have albums that we all love. We have we have areas of music where we don't agree completely, mm -hmm. um, and and there's a few bands, as you know, like Talk Talk, Radiohead, and Spiritualized that we all agree on. It's an area. It, it's why we play the music that we play because we all bonded over over this. Ladies and Gentlemen is one of the best albums 
we're an album band. We enjoy writing a, a body of work where you start the journey and you finish it. And you can obviously, you can dip in if you want, whatever, but we really like a, a, this body of work. And, and that's, I think that that's one of the greatest albums ever. Yeah. And it took them forever. Yeah, yeah seven, seven years to write that record. And weirdly, just after it came out, we started making our first album, the first version of our first album. And one of the studios we used uh, in Bath, or Bath, mm. as the Southerners call it, um, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's like, uh, that's where they worked for most of the record. So we were looking at our control room and it was for very early. Being at all. Exactly, yeah. And one of the engineers, do you remember Bruno had worked on it? And he, he was like, uh, he was telling us stories about what had gone on and what it was like to work with Jason Pierce and stuff. And, but it is, it's a work of art, it's an absolute masterpiece. And I gather it cost him personally quite a lot. Um, I bet it was very difficult to finish. There's obviously so much work gone into it. It's an area, you know, it, from our first album to this album, I think I'm in love, where this song is quite repetitive and cyclical and it just picks up something else in the next section is something else like that. Um, and it's kind of, it's probably responsible for any day now of the first album and maybe like charm off the last album. And, and there's a lot of songs in, in the middle there. And in, in terms of the lyric as well, it's like... It takes so long to build up. The loop's building up and building up and that beautiful bound guitar. And then you get this gorgeous sun in the middle of the afternoon. You get this lovely sort of high uh, description, you know, me, my spike and my arm in my spoon. goes and then the beat takes a while to come in and then he pitches I think I'm in love uh, and he must have sat there thinking what could possibly follow that and the backing vocal comes probably just hungry grounds for divorce one of one of our most successful songs um, me and Pot used to deliberately to annoy the rest of the band He'd play the riff from Grounds for Divorce, but he'd play it a bit more Jimmy Page, and I would sing with it like Robert Plant does from time to time. Which would sound something along the way, like... Well, you know that, you, you know that Led Zeppelin are great, but you, you, you're kind of like, you're listening to them sometimes and you think, you're having a laugh, lads. <laughs> so, so it's like, when they do the unison thing, ha, 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 it's like showing off, isn't it? Uh, you know what I mean? And, you, and you're thinking, Robert, come on. <laughs> So, so me and Paul used to go, ha, 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 exactly right. I was like, wow. actually, and we were like, quite, actually, that's quite cool, you know, because it was Pot's riff, like, but I didn't have any words. And um, I went down to this pub, um, the Temple of Convenience. It's a converted Victorian underground toilet, public toilet. And it's been turned into a bar, and it's smaller than this room. It must, yeah, couldn't be too big then. No, it's like 30 people, and it's absolutely chocker. Uh, and our friend Scott owns it, and I've been kicking around in it for years. Um, because of its underground nature, it That's is... the hole in the ground. It's the hole in the neighbourhood, exactly. And I used to live on this street, and I was always in this pub. Uh, and I was in there, my mate Tony's behind the bar, and I... I've got the thing on my phone. I was like, Pot's got this riff that he's been kicking about for years, but we've put some beef to it. Played it to Tony, who's also a musician. I was like, I don't know where to start. We don't usually write this kind of stuff. I don't know what to do. And he went, what about that lyric you wrote last night about the cocktails when you were in here? And I was like... You I remember that? No. And I, <laughs> and I was like, what, what are you on about? And he leaned over, and I was wearing the same shirt. And I had it on a piece of paper in my pocket. And he picked it out and handed it to me. And in my handwriting, it said, <laughs> I've been working on a cocktail called Grounds for Divorce. Wow. But I'd had no recollection of writing it down or coming up with it. I've been working on a cocktail called Grounds for Divorce. Whoa. 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 
thank you. Do you remember what you meant with those words? Oh, yeah, it's really obvious. It's like... You know, it means I'm drinking really heavily and I need to get the fuck out of here. (laughs) (laughs) Ghosts, is it? Yeah. Yeah, by Japan. I found this song through my sister, who who, um, is four years older than me, and um, she's just really into sort of like the whole indie scene and stuff like that. Just when I think I'm winning When I've broken every door of my life no wilder than before and I remember just playing Tin Drum this was kind of way after it was done it was probably kind of like mid 80s I assume wasn't it but this song it's sparseness and um, and how delicate it is and David Sylvian's voice as well is kind of like and you know, I love bands. I grew up loving bands like Duran Duran and stuff, but there's, there's, no, there's not much subtlety <laughs> in them. So for a song like Ghost to be a hit in, at, at this period is amazing. Yeah. It just sounds so effortless and, and so cool and fresh. And of its time, though, but it would stand up in any period. And it's just an, it's just an incredibly cool song. What do you reckon your own songs? Will they sound dated in 10, 20 years? Uh, you kind of hope not when you're writing, but of course, things as subtle as um, how you tune your snare drum, fashion changes it. How do you listen to your first songs now? We were going for Timeless, but it's still dated a little bit. But but like little things like, uh, my voice is younger, mm-hmm. but that's natural. But I, I wasn't quite singing fully in my own accent. So I was still singing love instead of love, you know, and, it, and it's like, it's, it, it makes me giggle actually to listen to the first time. <laughs> and also I'm not enunciating. It's like at, at that point when we were doing the first album, I had never discussed my lyrics with anyone, including the band. Like we just didn't talk about my words. It was only when the first album was reviewed and the journalist guessed correctly at what the songs were about which I remember feeling quite exposed. Uh-huh. People didn't mention what the songs were about, so I assumed I hadn't noticed or didn't know. And then this journalist, and I remember you specifically reading the paper and going, is that what that song's about? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> is and he right? It, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and is, was this something that, were you ashamed of, of the words you wanted to express? Or uh, Yeah, I'm very proud of my work, but it's, you know, I've, every now and again I go, Christ, I can't believe nobody stopped me there, you know? <laughs> Why this song? Uh, I play it regularly on my radio programme because it's one of them. If you, if you mention Louis Armstrong's Wonderful World, you know, people sometimes roll their eyes. Mm. Like, I heard it a thousand times. But if you put it on, by the end of it, everybody's always got their head on one side, you know. I see skies of blue Clouds of white What's, what's the difference, you, you, you think, between a cliché and something truly from here? Well, when we started trying to work it out, because what I suggested it, um, and there wasn't any rolling of eyes, but the lads were unsure, but when we started working it out, and it was just Mark on a guitar working out the chords, they're really beautiful chords. It's a really gorgeous sequence of chords. And I know that's, that sounds like... It, it's very rarely that beautiful, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, and I can't help thinking that when they wrote the lyric, it was to fit this gorgeous... Um, the way it flips between major and minor and, and the pace it progresses at, there really is many elements of the human exper- experience sort of very subtly and beautifully and kindly put. The reason we chose the song is because uh, without being a cheesy old hippie, which I'm afraid I am. Um, It's something that people need to be reminded of a little bit more right now. And I think it's kind of... The reason you don't express yourself if you're full of hope and love and joy, and uh, if you're a a life-confirmed joy spreader, like I am, uh, like the rest of the band are, it's not very cool, you know? And you, you kind of put the mockers on it, and you kind of... 
try and hide it under a bushel. Uh, well, that's not. I think I think it's just really important not to at the minute. I think it's really important to smile at people in the street and really important to, you know, one person smiling at you can be a day maker. You know what I mean? It's it's like spread that word. It might it might be a bit 1969, but it's. Um, It's still got Let's just stop making excuses for that then. Yeah, exactly, precisely. Thank you. No. Cheers to smile. Cheers. Babies cry. I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself. What a wonderful world Yes, I think to myself What a wonderful world